Welcome to Sea Time, everybody, the off-road show that brings you all the results, news, and online shenanigans that make being online a good time. We'd like to say thank you to Fly Racing for their support of Sea Time. Please go check them out at flyracing.com. Welcome to Seat Time, everybody. Brian Pierce here, your host for the fine Tuesday evening. Can you believe that October is almost over? Soon, we're all going to be wearing ugly Christmas sweaters and getting way too drunk off of champagne, waking up with hangovers going, oh my God, I'm never going to do that again. And then we're going to do it all over again and over again and over again. It's a vicious cycle, but it's one that for some strange reason we enjoy playing out, and that's the way we do it here. We're the beer drinking binge racing show called Seat Time, the online show for the off road enthusiast. Um, I'm not feeling that great, but I'm having a beer anyway. Uh, maybe it'll help. We shall see. Again, I'm your host, Brian Pierce. You can find me on the internet pretty much everywhere at, at Woody B. Pierce. That's my handle. Give me a follow, give me a shout out, and uh, we will chat on Z Internet. Of course, Seat Time is brought to you thanks to the fine folks uh, at Fly Racing, Kinda Tires. And still well performance. So Fly Racing, for those of you who do not know, please go check out flyracing.com. That is their website where you can find out all the information about their gear that they have going on. Obviously, we're about get, we're kind of getting into winter here. It sounds like a lot of people have been having issues with the fact that snow and cold weather has not completely come in yet. But remember to stock up. So you would probably get some good deals right now on gear that you can use for next year's spring and summer. And then, of course, you can start getting now your winter gear. So now that that's starting to get going. So if you don't find something you like on flyracing.com, go to your local dealer. Check out what they have in stock with Fly Racing. And, of course, you can ask them to carry it. They can order it for you, all that kinds of stuff. They get that through WPS, uh, the distributor there. So definitely big thanks to Fly Racing for their support. Of course, what you can do as well is go to kindatires.com and check out all the, the the good wares that they have there. Obviously, the sticky tires that they have and the hybrid stuff is, is what we feel works the best for us in some of the more extreme kind of enduro situations. Um, so, of course, they do have what I like to run is the Washugal 2s. Uh, those are kind of, for me, work all over in all those different random places um, that kind of middle-of-the-road tire. You know, you don't know if it's going to be too hard-packed. You don't know if it's going to be too nasty and sloppy. But if you do know it's going to be rocky, it's going to be slick, and it's going to be super gnarly, definitely check out the Equilibrium. And, of course, they do have some of their other even stickier compounds, um, knobbies made with the same Equilibrium sticky compound that you can try out. Again, if your local dealer does not carry Kenda, ask them to do so. They can call up Kenda, and they can get direct dis distribution through them. And that way they can get Equilibriums, and you can be an excited customer and happy. Watching while driving to the West Hair Scrambles... Hare and Hound doubleheader. Good job, Eric. So Eric is in our chat room, tlk.io slash seat time. Of course, that's a good way to get in there. Thank you, Eric, for uh, tuning in to seat time while driving your way. Uh, big thanks to Eric. A couple weeks ago, hooked us up with Steve Hinchfeld. He's going to be on a little bit later to talk about the Baja Rally. Awesome stuff. And apparently, he's won the Baja 1000 like seven times. I'm excited to talk about that shit because that's insane. Of course, huge, huge thanks to Stillwell Performance for their support of Seat Time. So stillwellperformance.com is the website where you can go to learn more about those guys. Or if you go to our YouTube channel or our website and just search for Stillwell Performance, you can find a lot of snippets of videos that we've put together. We have Alan on quite often throughout the year and, and talk with him about suspension. Now, granted, we do do a lot of 4CS talk with him just because of the fact that for some reason those four, well, he knows why, and he may, he he's told us why those forks have that weird stiff spot, and then they can blow past that stiff spot and literally just bottom out metal to metal. It's pretty weird, and it can be really dangerous, and, and they've got a great fix for that with the valving that they do and some of the other adjustments that they make to your internals. So check out stillwellperformance.com. Shoot them an email. Tell them you found out about them on the show. Get yourself a little bit of a discount, and enjoy the shit out of riding your bike off-road because keep her pinned is their fun little sl slogan. I think it's on the wall. No, it's keep her pinned. And that's what you should do. So what's been going on? So those are our sponsors. You can always find us on the site. We're on Stitcher. We're on iTunes, of course, if you just want to do audio only. So it's a good way. You know, if you like watching the show but can't catch it that way all the time, subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, whichever podcast, you know, or whatever podcast app you use. It's just an RSS feed that you can get and plug into your podcast app that way, when it gets updated, you can have that there as well. So it might be a good way for you to tune in and catch what we have going on here while it happens and then catch back up with it um, when you get to a little bit later on YouTube if you so 
choose to. Remember, go to Selfie and get the TKO raw long footage. It's over 15 minutes of raw footage from the TKO Enduro. Uh, people are like, oh, it's not really relevant anymore. I completely disagree. It is absolutely epic. Our six minutes that we have up on YouTube that you can go find, the TKO raw footage from this year's uh, and last year's, that is still getting a shit ton of hits every day, every week, every month since that event happened. So I know that people will enjoy the crap out of over 15 minutes of raw footage from that event. So definitely go check that kind of stuff out. Uh, seems like, oh man. And then of course we've got, uh, what just recently happened. Some of the things that just recently happened, Red Bull Rampage. So Kurt Sorgi is the second person in 10 years of history to win the Red Bull, Ram- Red Bull Rampage twice. We're going to, hopefully Kelly McGarry is going to be able to jump on here. I know he's been having, it seems like he's having some technical issues, even though we've got all our shit shorted out to jump on the show. But through that, what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about Rampage. It's an interesting sport. I think there's a lot of crossover in this fact that so many people watch Rampage. And it's a great time. He is a Kenda athlete, so he gets a chance to use a lot of Kenda mountain bikes on his on his mountain Kenda tires on his mountain bike. And of course I'm sure that if he has a dirt bike, he gets a chance to to throw some Kenda tires on that bad boy as well. Um, and then also recently we had the GNCC event. We had uh, Powerline Park. Josh Strang got another win. Super, super awesome to see him. And if you didn't just see, the bloopers did come out from that event. Uh, literally five minutes before we went live, the bloopers guy put out his Powerline Park mud hole blooper. Uh, it's some great stuff in there. He's got like three, four minutes of ATVs and uh, the, the quads and bikes together. I mean, I'm telling you, dude, those quad dudes, there's no way they did not wake up without whiplash. Like, holy crap. It is insane to watch this. You just, oh, mm. it's worth watching. And you will giggle and you will hoot and you will holler. Bring in the family. They will hoot and holler. You're going to have a good time doing it. And then uh, recently, too, was the Everett Enduro Cross, where we saw Cody Webb get another win. Colton Haker there on the podium. And, of course, Taylor Roberts. So the the three guys that we've seen kind of in and out uh, on the podium this year uh, have been there again. So it's been, it's been some good stuff going on there. Is your mic on, Stephen? Can you chat for a little bit? I can turn it on. All right. So, uh, what what's the what's the scoop right now on uh, on Mister McGarry? Uh, it sounds like he's resetting his modem. Uh, so, do we think that actually means anything? Uh, hopefully that it's resetting his mo- his modem. We so, shall see. We shall yeah. see. It, it's it's every time. It's just like ridiculous. I don't know what the deal is. Um, I wish that I had enough time during the day to commit to this where I could uh, just do a test call with everybody. Oh, yeah, hey. Yeah, that, that, that'd help out a lot. Does Skype work? Oh, awesome. Cool. We'll go ahead. That way, when the show comes up, do everything you just did all over again, and we should be good to go. We should be good to go. Yeah. So um, what was cool is we're helping promote the Moto7 premiere that's going to be going on in Dallas November 12th. Um, so this past weekend, if you guys didn't uh, pay attention, we did actually have a winner for some of the tickets that we were giving away. So there was a TCCRA race. It was the last one of the season, uh, Patriot Park, brand new place. And what we did is just said, go ahead, have a great weekend, ride the crap out of your motorcycles, uh, be around your moto family, take a bunch of pictures, put them on Instagram, use the hashtag pintful of awesome, which we use a lot with fly racing, which we're thankful for with them. And then of course, moto seven. So we went through those and we found a really cool one. It's this really cool sequence sequen- shot that we found uh, that was going on. And uh, so uh, Candy Mama or something of that sort. So she, went, she, she got the ticket. She's super excited. She went ahead and bought a couple more. So if, you're gonna, if you want to come to the Dallas premiere November 12th, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not inclusive. It's exclusive. Anybody can come. You just go to the moto-themovie.com. And with that, you can go to tour Dallas premiere. And through that, you can buy tickets. And you get them right there through Eventbrite. And you can buy your tickets. So... It's a good way to do that, and that way you can uh, come to the Dallas premiere and party with us. We're going to be there. We're going to be giving away koozies. We're going to be having a good time chatting it up with everybody. So we got Clay, uh, so Eric in the chat room again, giving fun stuff to talk about. Clayton Gerster, Ger, Gerstner. Gerstner? We'll go with that. Won the Honey Badger Sprint Enduro in Flagstaff, Arizona, round seven of the Kenda SRT Western Checkpoint Enduro Championship. That's kind of cool that they did that. So not only so the Western Checkpoint Enduro Championship, from what I understand, is actually still a timekeeping series most of the time. But 
they had a sprint enduro this past weekend. So I think that's really cool that they're getting they're, they're kind of changing it up, trying some stuff out and see how it's going. That could almost be kind of fun if you could find a series where you get a little bit of timekeeping, you get a little bit of sprint enduros, maybe you get a little bit of national enduro format. I don't know, but then people would probably be pissed off if they had to do a timekeeper in the middle of all that. I could see people being weird about that kind of stuff. I don't know. We'll see. So, Steven, I saw you trying things. What's going on? Yeah, looks like he's got cell phone connection. So we'll see if that works. Hello. Hello, how's it going? Good. Well, you sound like a Kiwi, so at least we got a we got a Kiwi, if nothing else. Yeah, you got a Kiwi. <laughs> yeah. All the internet on this uh, this house just died right on uh, the time that we're supposed to call you. <laughs> Man, this is the worst time ever. That's okay. You have no idea how many show, how many technical difficulties this show has. So we appreciate you taking the time to come on. And this way, you only get to hold your phone for like ten to fifteen minutes, opposed to sit in front of your computer for longer. So, okay, cool. Not the worst time ever. So, welcome to Sea Time. I know, you know, being a mountain biker, you may not be totally associated with the show, and that's okay. We are the beer drinking, bench racing show that talks about all things really off road, but we're more dirt bike centric. But with that, with Rampage just happening, you're a Kinder sponsored rider. We're sponsored by Kinder. We thought this was a great chance for some bitching cross promotion. And you have the best fucking hair in the world. So. You needed to be on the show. So, dude, just break it down for us. What the hell's going on? How's your evening? Oh, it's going all good, man. I'm just I'm chilling here. I'm close to Park City in Utah. Um, I'm just actually packing up all my gear because I'm flying back to New Zealand in the morning. And, yeah, just had a pretty hectic couple of weeks here at Rampage. And, um, yeah, just um, stoked to be shutting down over here and uh, heading back for another summer in New Zealand, basically. That that blows my mind. Like I, I can't even imagine what life would be like if you're like, okay, well now that the summer's over in America, I'm gonna go fly to the other part of you know the world and have another summer. And so so do you choose? Do you do that all the time? Just literally like summer to summer to summer, or do you just you know every once in a blue moon you pick up and have a winter somewhere? No, man, I haven't, I haven't had a winter since um, 2006. So I've basically had 20 summers in a row. And so yeah, I'm just I'm working on the tan. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I have to ask: is is your tan a thong? Like, I mean, because I'm just twenty summers. You gotta like have worked in some weird ass sun sun lines. You know what I mean? Some weird ass <laughs> tan lines every now and again, just to change it up. I tell you what, man. The the summer, I mean, the sunshine down in Australia and New Zealand, it'll it'll kick your butt, man. It's <laughs> there must be some big holes in the ozone down there, but you you, you rock out with the shirt off. Uh, there for a day and you, you're feeling pretty toasted at the end of the day. It's like it's way more mellow over here. So, yeah, definitely uh, work on my tan more when I'm down there. But, yeah, you know, always work, always working on the tan. I'm, I'm sure, too, down there you've got – I don't know if you've got super great access to beaches. It just seems like you would since it's a huge island that there's a lot of a lot of beach. But in Park City, Utah, it's probably just lake action where, the, you know, you've got ladies hanging out in bitchy bikinis, I'm sure. But uh, it's probably just lake lake action for for the for the most part. Yeah, man, there's no beaches to, beaches here in Park City, but um, there is a hell of a lot of good mountain biking, so that kind of makes up for it, right? Oh yeah, that's for sure, and that's what you're great at, what you're known for. So you you how long have you said you said to 2006, 20 summers? So I mean, how so 2013 is when you got second at Rampage. It's like. How did you and why did you come to the States to try to start making this mountain bike career for yourself? Or is that what caused it? I mean, kind of talk us through the beginning of all that. Oh, well, yeah, man. Like, um, like New Zealand's, it's, it has a scene, but man, the mountain bike scene is nowhere near as huge as it is over here. So if you kind of want to um, take it seriously and, and do this for a job, you really have to travel over here and, and also Europe. So you got to, you got to, um, get out and travel and, and, you know, ride all the contests in here in Europe and just get out there and make a name for yourself kind of thing. So that's kind of what I did from, uh, yeah, like 2006 onwards. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I do for a job now and uh, it's pretty damn fun <laughs> and definitely <laughs> could be worse jobs if you ask me. I would agree. I think that, uh, that some of the jobs I have are probably worse than that. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting that you're able to do that and bitch it at the same time. Does your hair ever just piss you off? I mean, be honest. 
Like, you look um, awesome, and I'm sure the chicks want to run their hands through that shit all the time. But, I mean, you've true. just got to fucking want to chop that shit off every now and again. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, it, it's definitely a pain in the ass sometimes, you know. Like, um, sometimes when I do, a, like, a 360, like, I saw a spin off the lip, and then my hair actually completely blindfolds me the whole way around. So I can't see anything. Um yeah. If, kinda, if only the judges knew the technical difficulty that that adds exactly, to your jump. Higher. But, Holy um, shit. Yeah, no, uh, it, it's, it's a pain in the butt sometimes, but for the most part, uh, don't want to look like I, uh, I'm a member of the army, so I just uh, I just roll with the long hair and it's good. I like it. No, it's funny. Um, so I'm a, you know, I mountain bike and stuff, but in the long run, more of a dirt biker. Uh, we were out practicing a race one time, and I was kind of growing my hair out, and my bangs just kept fucking going past my helmet and getting in my way. And since it was a practice, I knew I could stop. And I just pulled in. I saw a buddy's dad that I knew always kept tools with him in his little butt pack. So I pulled over. I was like, dude, you have got to have a pair of scissors in there. He did. I took my helmet off, grabbed my bangs. I just chopped them off right there, put the helmet back on, and oh. kept going. And it was the most bitchin' mullet that is ever. Like, I mean, because it was like... I didn't look. I didn't care. I just grabbed them and cut. So it was like, you know, an inch long bangs and then just like the hair that was growing out. It was uh, shitty, but it, it worked. So, I mean, I figured at some point in time, hopefully if that happens, you'll send us a picture. Yeah, yeah. man. Uh, if I do ever cut this lot off, I'm going to rock a mullet for at least a few weeks because i got like some pretty good material sitting back there and I think I could have a pretty decent mullet. Oh, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit of Rampage. So... We move into you getting second place 2013, 12th place 2014, which was your like front wheel blowing up on your pretty much landing to flat on the Canyon Gap. And we go to 2015, where you kind of moved down the 19th place, had a little bit more of a rough year with the, the judging, and then, of course, making your way into the finals and all that kinds of fun stuff. So of all the memorable stuff that happened between 2013 and 2015, what's, what, what just sticks out in your mind the most? Yeah, I mean, like, 2013 was obviously, like, a, a super good year, and, yeah, wound up second, and then 2014 had, like, a couple of serious crashes, like, <laughs> uh, especially that that one um, when I overshot the canyon, like, I was pretty lucky to be walking away from that, and, um, yeah, you know, I went through three bikes as well on, in that competition, Um <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, this year, man, a pretty big priority for me was just staying out of the crash reel and staying out of hospital, you know, like I really, I really couldn't do it like both physically and just for my career. Like I, I didn't want to be that guy that just, uh, is lying in a, in a heap on the other side of the Canyon gap. So yeah, I just took a line that I knew could ride, I could ride well, and um, I, just, I just rode it. And you know, I had a, had a good rampage, and um, I'm walking away and, and flying home for another summer. And there's a hell of a lot of guys from rampage this year that are not doing that, that are sitting in hospital right now because it was it was a huge um, rampage as far as injuries go. Like there were some pretty bad ones, and I mean, it's a crazy competition and the consequences of the stuff that you do are pretty high. And so the, I felt like this time I just really needed to definitely stay out of the crash reel and, and just be healthy after, after Rampage. And, and, and I did that, and, I, I mean, I'm stoked to kind of give her a bit more shit next year, you know, like I, I want to push it again next year. So it, just, it was just one of those things that kind of had to happen for me, and uh, that was that. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man, and I'm and, and it's totally understandable. Like there are times when you can kind of go, you know what? I have hit the deck a few too many times. Instead of holding it at one ten, I'm going to find ninety percent, and I'm just going to have fun. You know, it's not going to not be fun, but at the same time, I have a feeling when you're not, you know, riding on that edge, obviously there's less chance of falling off of it because that sucks. And you've you've had that happen quite a few times, and and you you said it. If anybody hasn't seen that 2014 wreck where he f- pretty much flat bottoms coming off of that canyon gap, uh, his front wheel blows up. He completely tucks under. The fact that he did not literally, his head did not separate from his body. I think he's actually, the fact that he's walking is a miracle alone, but uh, the fact that his head is even still attached, it, it's insane. You could see when he comes up, the dirt just falling out of his helmet from his, the way his head scooped the deck. Like, it's intense. So... But you said it. 
seven riders injured at Rampage this year, and it's interesting because you know I invited you to be on the show, and you and I, you said yes, and we chit chatted a little bit about that, and then later that day, you know, Brandon Thurman on Vital MX puts up his post, um, you know, the risk versus reward. Um, of, of rampage, and, and a lot of people have talked about that in the past. You know, should be should riders be paid more? Should they not have to sign away essentially like the the rights that Red Bull's not responsible for their bodies and you know and injuries that can occur and stuff? And I, I kind of wanted to. Know, I mean, I just figured you're going to be on. It's a great topic to talk about. Like, what are your thoughts about that? I, I'm sure that you've read what Brandon wrote. Uh, if you haven't, I can give you a quick synopsis. But kind of, what are your thoughts on a what he wrote and then b is he right? Is he wrong? And, and and maybe where did he miss 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 a cue or two? Yeah, man. I mean, if if yeah, on social media right now, it's it's crazy. It's just a wash with like rampage negativity and people ragging on the whole thing and and just yeah, people writing their uh, their theories on the whole thing and and man, it, it's yeah, it's a tough one to kind of assess, you know. Like um, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people uh, did get hurt and. And, and it's risky and, and um, you know, like, but I feel like we all do know that going into it, you know, it is risky and, and, and no one does force you to ride. We kind of show up because we want to ride and, and show the world what we got. Um, I think there's like a, a few uh, things maybe on Red Bull's half that could be changed, but, you know, like, I feel like we shouldn't be too harsh on them because, um if everyone's so negative about it, I think that, uh, you know, the event might not come back, you know, and then everyone will be like, oh, my God, Red Bull Rampage is gone. And it's, well, that's what happens when everybody kind of jumps on the bandwagon and just hates on the whole thing. Right. Understood. Um, yeah. And I think with the the injury stuff, it's tough. You're right, because they say, "Hey, you guys, you know, this is, you know, you guys are the ones who are going to push yourself. If you're the one that wins, like Kirk Sorge did this year, you know, you're the one that's going to try a bunch of crazy ass shit." And then we saw with Pat, with Paul B, when he went down. I mean, he was he pretty much had what I think a lot of people were already going, "Oh my God, that's the winning run right there." And unfortunately, he 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 bit it and had to go to the hospital, and shit's not good for him right now. But you know, he was going for that winning run, and I don't think that there was any pressure from Red Bull in that sense to like go out there and do it. He wanted to go win Rampage. Um, now, you did mention a couple things that you think could change, and I'm and I'm not saying that you're going to make enemies. I have, I've, but what are some of those minor things that that might help? Um, I I would think that, and this is a, my assertion just from looking outside, looking in, is that it seems interesting with the build crew stuff this year. I think that that is becoming so much more a part of Rampage that that should be something that they should help riders and dig crews out with. Like It's like, hey, we're going to give a rider X amount of dollars to help you build and dig. And however you choose to use that is how you choose to use that. If that's you fly in eight of your friends or if you fly in three of your friends and buy equipment, like whatever... But if they just said every rider who's invited gets X amount of dollars towards have towards a you know building and digging, that that I think that would be an awesome way to show more support toward the riders and the effort that you guys have to put in before the actual event versus you know like you said you guys know the risks you take those risks that's nothing to do with Red Bull. Um, so what what are some of the what for you though as a rider what are some of the little things you could see that might be different to help in the overall scheme. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the whole thing is, is like the most long winded competition of all the competitions that we go to in the year, you know, and you've got to bring a team. Cause it's like, unlike, two, it's pretty much two weeks for you guys, right? It is two weeks. Yeah. yeah. It's two weeks, man, out there. And you know, you got, we've got to pay, we're going to pay for our own, uh, hotels and, um, and kind of look after the dig crew as best we can as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guys like, that you know it, it costs them you know quite a few grand to just show up and and um put their balls on the chopping block <laughs> so yeah i mean it it, it kind of would be cool if they could help out a bit like that and um and also with the insurance as well um you know uh it would be cool like to have like a little bit of secondary cover perhaps from them you know mm-hmm. um just to fill, fill in the gaps from our own insurance um, maybe or 
I mean, yeah, there's it's a it's a pretty complex um, subject actually. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I still have I still have a lot of red, uh, respect for Red Bull and stuff like making events like this. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have the oh, scene yeah. like we do. And so I don't want to be too harsh on them at all, but. At the same time, yeah, there maybe is a couple of um, things that they could do just to level the situation out a little bit. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and for those of you who, again, you know, if, if you're interested in kind of what we're chatting about with Rampage, there's even more There's out there. You can go to Vital MTB. You can find a bunch of stuff there. Pink Bike's got some really good coverage. And that's just to learn more about the event. We're not talking about finding out about all the, the BS that people are saying on the social media about you know, the negativity like Kelly's talking about. We're talking about learning more about the event in general. And one of the cool things is that they've started a, a donation for Paul Basagodia, uh, who did get really injured. He's got a, 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 at the time when I was doing notes and such, he still couldn't feel his lower legs. Really bad wreck. So you guys can go and donate if you wanted to give a chance to just help out, help the community. We do this all the time in the motorcycle world. There's no reason to not help out another two wheeled brother over on that end. So you're get so Kelly, you're getting ready to head to New Zealand. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get there? Dude, the first thing I do when I get to New Zealand is I'm probably going to um, hang out with my girlfriend for around about, uh, I don't know how long. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's like and then I'm actually pretty psyched to um, <laughs> ride my moto. I've got, ah. I got, a, I got a RMZ 450 at home and uh, I've been riding that quite a lot, so I'm I'm pretty psyched to get out on that, and then uh, yeah, you know, like the whole mountain biking scene will be um, just kicking off because it's spring there. So my buddies will be would have been cooped up for winter uh, for the last six months, so they'll be getting at me to go ride. So it'll be just like uh, yeah, go ride and and just have a great summer. You know, the New Zealand scene is uh, it's cranking down there. Like so many people coming down for off season uh, trips and stuff, and yeah, I mean. Dude, you can keep super busy there the whole summer. I bet, man. We've got a, a couple good friends of ours, uh, Toby Price and like Josh Strang, uh, Daniel Milner, or, uh, on the dirt bike side of things. Uh, they are always like, you've got to come to Australia. You've got to come ride. And we're like, one day, it'll happen. I'm sure. Whenever I hit the lottery and I can afford to send my dirt bike and all my <laughs> other shit over there, I'm going to show up, you know, <laughs> but uh, no, it sounds like it's a blast. And obviously on the mountain bike side of things, you guys probably have a little more access to, to riding areas than, than the moto do, because it sounds like it's a little bit, it's a little bit interesting, like kind of like it is in Europe. Like a lot of the places you can ride, it's only kind of on race weekends and things like that. So I'd hope in the, the, the mountain bike side of things, it's a little bit different, but well, cool. Well, you know, as, as I like to do, we get a little weird with our questions sometime. I mean, did you buy... A sm- do you think that you'll have like a small can of lube or do you think you're going to go like economy sized for the hours you're going to be cooped up with your girlfriend? Oh, uh, dude, I, got, I have like a 44 gallon drum on the roof and it just like, yeah, you know, I've got as much as I want there. So we're good. <laughs> we have we've got it's a waterproof sheets and there's a is a spigot and that spigot's not for water. So don't try to drink out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. Your questions do get pretty weird, but I'm good with it. <laughs> well, you're from uh, being being a Kiwi, and then like a lot, of, like I said, a lot of the Australians that we've had on, it's like a like they've said some crazy ass shit. So I'm like, all right, whenever they're you know down from those crazy ass islands, I'm just gonna go for it. So it's okay. I think I think we're in, man. <laughs> just just send it, buddy. Just send it. You're right? all good. Well, hell yeah, dude. Well, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having so much fun and for being such an awesome. Uh, steward and bitchin' athlete for us to look up to in the mountain bike world. Definitely send us some pictures when you get on the moto. We'll be excited to see those and fly safe, I guess, right? All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Hell yeah, man. Take it easy. Cheers. Later, boys. Peace. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, it was a little bit to get it set up, but obviously we got it figured out. It's always interesting, Steven, when they're in the handheld position like that because it's like kind of jumpy and it kind of moves around a good bit. But you know what? I'm glad we make it work. And is it not fun, though, Stephen, when we get a, a Kiwi on, especially or a, an Australian on, somebody that's not always in the scene, and they're just you don't really know what you're going to get. You can have a little bit of fun with them. Yeah, it's that unknown. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Ooh, have we told cool. Stephen? I just texted him or Steve. You're Stephen. Uh, yeah, you'll be Steve. 
Um, so again, for those of you who don't realize, so w- the way we got hooked up with Kelly is a uh, good, f- you know, our good friends and sponsors over at Kenda Tire. So KendaTire.com is where you could check them out. Mike Tosh got us in touch with their, uh, their the bicycle Kenda rep, and then their bicycle Kenda rep. You know, I was supposed to be at Rampage last week, but the way that all that got screwed up and the times dates moving around and stuff, it didn't work out. So, but. Obviously, Kelly was super nice enough to be able to come on and, and and just help us out, and it was awesome, and I'm so glad that we made that happen. So, this evening, though, on our second guest, we've got Steve Hingfeld. I might have said that wrong, and hopefully he will correct me, and we will see what's going on. So, what's up, Steve? Are you on? Yeah, how's it going tonight? Dude, so good. Oh, my gosh. We had so much fun with Kelly McGarry. He's a Kiwi from New Zealand, and he's getting ready to head back with his mountain bike and go ride. He said he's been going 20 summers straight, flying back and forth between America and back to New Zealand. Can you imagine how awesome that would be to be able to do that on your dirt bike? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, to be able to go from continent to continent, that'd be uh, that'd be a dream for sure. I know. He said he's been doing that since 2006. I was like, he must make a lot of money on his mountain bike during the six months he's here to then be able to hop trail for another six months over back to New Zealand because I can imagine that's not very cheap, but... You know, being that you've raced in Baja a lot as well, you've probably spent a pretty penny on your motorcycle doing that just down in Mexico. So, yeah, no, I've, unfortunately, I've been able to travel all over the world and spend a lot of time down in Oz, um, in Australia, doing uh, some off-road racing down there as well in the summertime or our summertime and their winter time. So, right. I kind of understand what he does. Yeah, for sure. Man, uh, well, one day, one day, you'll just have to put me in your luggage next time you go, Steve. I'd be excited to be your your pack mule. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of extra weight, extra heavy bag there. Yeah, extra but, uh, 50, 50 bucks. I'm worth 50 bucks, I promise. I'm totally worth 50 bucks. <laughs> well, dude, congratulations on getting the Baja Rally win this, uh, this you know, just very recently, a month ago. Um, I remember when you got third place last year. I was there for 2014. Super epic good time at the rally. And uh, congratulations. So, big thing, what was it different? maybe from last year to this year that got you the win or was it not that it was something different just that this year was your year? Uh, you know, it was, it was still a challenge. It was just, this year was my year. I mean, last year, uh, I was pretty, you know, a lot of people, I was pretty much an unknown in the rally world. Um, known if I could read a road book and, and whatnot. And I come out the first day in the lead. Um, I did make one big, error on the day when we had to reroute around some water and I was the first guinea pig and I submerged the bike. So that kind of took me out of the lead. Um, oh, I do remember that. That was, that was when we had the, the big meeting that night. Uh, and everybody was like, you know, no, you can't do this or yes, you can do. I mean, there was, there was a lot of stink about that day. Wasn't there? Yeah, there was a lot of stink. Everybody was kind of going every which way, trying to figure out how to get across when high tide was at the, at the ocean. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a group of us, or there was, I was the first one I got stuck, and there was a group that uh, decided to, hey, let's all wait and help everybody get through it, and there was a big stink because somebody said, yeah, let's all wait, and then once they got across, they took off. So a lot of the other guys were pissed off. I mean, I was happy that people wanted to help me yeah. um, and, and do, do it like a team as far as that went, but, uh, you know, this year I turned it around, uh, rode pretty solid, had one bad day. Um, where I hit the ground pretty hard leading, but uh, got up and still finished out that day first. So, you know, I just turned it around and made made it a positive thing for sure. Wicked, man. I, and so, you know, we, we did a lot of talking about the Baja Rally last year, and then obviously we had uh, Scotty Bowman on before the event, and then we got a chance to talk to a little bit of people about Baja Rally um, after the event. So from 2014 to 2015, would you say that this year was more technical? Was the roadbook harder and not harder as in more trickier? Because the idea is they're not trying to trick you. They're, they want you to find the course. It's just that sometimes you got to pay attention to the navigation. Um, so kind of if you were to say which one was harder and then why was it different? Um, I would say this year was a little bit more technical Mm -hmm. uh the road book was a little bit more tricky there's a lot more hp um you know where you're just going off of your uh off a head your compass arrow yeah okay um yeah your heading um there was a lot of that this time where last time we barely did any of that or last year i should say and this year i mean that was kind of new to me i had never ridden so many miles just on a compass heading and hoping to go the right way to hit that uh 
GPS check uh, waypoints they had marked out there for us. Yeah. Is that not the most nerve-wracking thing? I, I mean, because myself, I grew up racing in the woods, following, you know, doing enduros, following the arrows, you know, but technically when you're following the arrows, most of the time you're on some kind of trail, you know, and, and if you're on, even if you're on new terrain, if you're not on the first five rows, you're still on some kind of, you know, marked trail you know you're seeing uh, tire markings but you're in your case yeah, it, when yeah, you're it, in the front like that you got nothing except that compass heading yeah it's just a compass heading i mean we're going through bushes uh through big uh big creosote bushes i mean you know, you're just trying to find your compass heading and however you got to get there you get there but you're basically going over virgin ground there is no road there is no trail and, you know, a couple times I was leading, so there was nothing uh, but bushes, and you just kind of blast your way through them and stick on your compass heading uh, and find that GPS waypoint. Once the buzzer goes off, you hit it, you go to the next one. Uh, there was one section where there was like six of those all in a row, oh. and uh, it was pretty crazy going through this field with, uh, you know, everybody just kind of riding through it. Oh, trying man. To, you know, you, you, had to follow, you had to follow your waypoint, because if you just tried to follow the guy in front of you, which I was leading at a guy trying to follow me, he wasn't getting all the GPS, so he was getting all the waypoints. So he was getting kind of mixed up because they had it kind of, you know, kind of kind of gnarly in this one huge field, probably, you know, a uh, thousand acre field. And uh, we were just hitting all these waypoints and you had to hit them in sequence. So it was pretty, pretty nerve wracking there for a little while. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's gotta be intense. Um, so, you know, being at the rally, coming down into Baja, it, it, or coming down to Baja for you is not abnormal. You've won the Baja Baja one thousand seven times. You know Baja five hundred six different times. Um, so you've been down there racing a lot. How would you say that type of racing, you know, differs from a rally event? And obviously, in this case, kind of specific to the Baja rally. And and how do you think we would try to get some of the Baja racers that are kind of, you know, very typical to the 1,000 and 500 and 250 to realize that these Baja rally events are as fun, if not maybe sometimes more fun, I would think. Oh, no, there, I, I, you know, I'm really liking the rally thing. Um, you know, I, I like, I, I, I consider riding rallies like playing chess while you're riding your motorcycle. You got to go fast. You got to be able to read. Um, you got to be able to use your head, not overthink it, not panic when you don't find something. You know, got to do math in your head because you got to, you know, if you've gone too far, you got to recalibrate it. You know, it just, it, it, there's a lot more mental. Where Baja, yeah, Baja is gnarly. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Baja is its own gem. Um, but you do get to pre run, you do get to see where you're going uh, for the most part. Yeah, there's, there's things that pop up you know, here and there, but for the most part, Baja racing, you can, you know, pre-run, you know where you're going. Rally racing, you haven't a clue. Uh, you may get on a road. Oh, wow. This road probably goes for 15 miles. Don't think that cause you're going to be pulling off of it, you know, soon. And who knows where they're taking you. You don't know where you're going. Um, so it's, it's pretty awesome. I really like it. Um, I've really, uh, ad adapted quite well to it. I feel, and I'm looking for forward to some more rallies for sure. Yeah, I, I am as well. Um, I got a chance to do you know the rally last year, and that was my first foray into Baja at all. That was the first time you know I'd known of Baja and all the races that they were having down there. But that was my first chance to get a chance to actually ride down there. Then I got a chance to do the Rip to Cabo, you know, with Cameron Steele and those guys down in April. And right now that there's the there's the decision to make. So for 2016, do I do the Rip again or do I do the rally again? And I think now that I've done the rally and I've done the rip, I feel like it's time to kind of like go back to the rally, you know, and kind of like switch it off every other year. You know, obviously time and money, if that if it works out, kind of a situation. Uh, but you've done the rip before, isn't that right, with Cameron and those guys? I, you know, I have not been able – I've never joined Cameron on the okay. rip. Um, obviously, I've ridden the continent or the, you know, the Baja Peninsula quite a few times with me and a couple buddies, you know, and done that. Uh, but uh, actually, I was talking to Cameron at the rally this year. We were talking about maybe me joining him next year, uh, just kind of going down as a Baja, you know, Baja celebrity, I guess you'd say it for the uh, we'll, Baja we'll 1000. Call you, we'll call you such. an ambassador, I think. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, I think. I think uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, yeah, I've done the, you know, ridden that, you know, the peninsula a lot. And, you know, Baja to me, uh, when, when, 
my favorite part of Baja is south is the south, southern end from say you know Mulahe to Cabo San Lucas. That's 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 where I that is my that's what I love the most about Baja. Right. Uh, if anyone ever gets a chance to ride any of those hills through San Javier, Loreto, all that stuff, it's just remarkable and uh, it's a great time. Do you think that? As the rally grows, as Baja Rally grows, that the, we'll get a chance to ride more of the peninsula. I believe, if I looked at it correctly, you guys did head a little bit more south this year than you did last year. But, you know, I mean, in, in four days, five days of racing, do you think that we would ever get a chance to ride three quarters of the peninsula? I believe, you know, um, that, that we could uh, race more of the peninsula. We just, I think they would have to maybe start it a little further south. Mm, okay. Um, you know, it is it is its only third year, um, and it, they've done really well, I feel, with it. I've d- done a lot of races in my time, and Scotty Bloom and all the, you know, the people that work for the organization have really come a long way just in, from last year to this year. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, everything's so well detailed and laid out that uh, I think that, you know, that they, in the next couple of years, I think you'll see it going further south for sure. Okay, cool. I hope so. Because um, I, I would agree, like when I got a chance to do the rip, again, that's only my second time on the peninsula, but um, it's so interesting how diverse the land is down there. Like, granted, everything's dry. Like that's, you're not going to, you're not really going to find too much mud and, unless, of course, you're at the Baja Rally last year where you guys got stuck in high tide and then it was just quicksandy kind of <laughs> shit. But, um, it really is crazy how much different stuff you can come across. We got a chance to do the rock trail um, uh, at uh, on the rip, and that's that fourteen miles of crazy ass, uh, you know, rock rock trail. But have you? Is there a lot like that on the peninsula? Like, if you wanted to find that gnarly kind of rock terrain, can you find more of that, or is that just like weirdly located in that one one area? No, you can pretty much find it all all up and down the peninsula. Uh-huh. Um, that's what makes Baja so unique. I mean, you know, for instance, at like the Baja 500, you start at sea level. Uh, in a couple hours, you're racing up in the pine trees, back down to the desert floor. I mean, it, it has so much of variety all down throughout the peninsula. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I noticed that, dude. I freaked out when we went into those pine trees because I remember seeing helmet cam footage of Kirk Caselli down, riding down in Baja and saw those pine trees, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, like, but it was so weird because of the fact starting in Ensenada, it was just kind of like, okay, we're in a port and then we're seeing desert and now all of a sudden we're in pine trees. And that was so epic. So obviously you could tell I'm fanboying out a little bit about Baja, but it's a lot of fun. So, oh yeah, yeah it's, it, so I wanted, you're a Baja veteran. You've been racing down there for a long time. You've done extremely well in your years racing down there. So I wanted to kind of get from you a couple bits of tips and tricks. So, if you had one thing to say for somebody who maybe has never ridden Baja before, you know, one tip that's just like, when you go to Baja, you do X, like, or prepare for X, what would it be from you? Well, I mean, to prepare or when you're down there, what's one of the top things you need? I mean, uh, you know, there's, I, I there's think, so I, much. I think, I think what's one of the top things that you would need? I think that's a great way to put it. I think a lot of people that go to Baja... The, the, the number one top thing before you go, make sure you go there with a fully prepared motorcycle. Okay. Don't show up on the bike you've been, you know, railing out for the last six months every day, not really changing the oil like your practice bike, and then decide to go ride in Baja. It's not going to happen. You need to go down there. The best thing I've ever, you know, I would recommend is make sure you prep your bike 100% so when you're down there in the middle of nowhere, you don't, you have zero issues. Mm, I like that. I like that. Yeah. And, that's, you know, I blew up the 450, and there's a good chance that it's, like, shitty roads, bad gearing, all kinds of stuff. But we had never ridden Baja before, so there was a lot on us of, of the fact that, you know, we didn't get a chance to really test that motorcycle in in the conditions. And so there's no telling what happened to, the, you know, what actually happened to that engine. But to his point, it's like there was also on the rip, there was a dude who went down there on a 2014 MX 450, you know, and he kept, you know, and he sold Cameron on the fact that he rode this thing off road, did all this kinds of stuff. First day, I think 40 something miles into the, into the ride bike blows up. Um, so I think, Oh yeah. I mean, that's, no, go ahead. Yeah. That's one of the things, you know, uh, check your valves for one. Uh, don't matter how new your bike is or not. That's an easy check you can do before you go down to Baja. Check your valve clearance. 
make sure they're not going to tighten up on the trail so you'll be able to start your bike up when you know when you fall down or when you stop at the taco shop and have a taco or a beer that they'll fire up and you can continue the ride with your buddies i mean that little things like that you know or chain and sprockets when you go down to ba always show up with brand new chains and sprockets um that way you won't have an issue with breaking a a sprocket because you've worn the chain out or the chain snapping because it's got you know hours and hours on it Um, those are just little things that you can do that'll save you and then okay so i don't know if you saw the video of me hitting the cactus on the rip but it was horrible it sucked and that was when i learned how to remove choya cactus needles from my arm um in a very painstakingly slow process so in that case you know, do you have any tips and tricks on either A, removing cactus needles, or B, another kind of like, holy shit, don't get hurt in Baja, and if you do, this is how you take care of it? Um, yeah, like for the cactus needles, um, if, if you still have the ball of the choya still on you. Yeah. Um, I care, you know, when you're pre-running, I don't really necessarily do it when they're racing, but when you're pre-running, I pack a little pit comb. Um... And that way you can pull the ball off of your arm that's stuck to your arm or your shoulder rather than grabbing it with your other hand and getting more choya stuck in your hand. I just grab a pick comb and pop it off that way. Yep. That's so what, you can uh, continue the ride. And then when you get to the hotel that night or wherever you're staying, then you can have you know somebody with some tweezers pick the rest of them out. Yeah, they can be your nurse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, right there on the trail, it was uh, uh, we had uh, Bill Grant. There, he, he was awesome, dude. Was they were picking shit out for me and everything. But we get up there and start talking to Jimmy Stones, and he goes, and he goes, "This is what you need." And that's what he pulled out of his his pulled out of his jacket pocket, right there on the left side, so his right hand could reach it really easy. Was his pit comb, and you know he uses those yep. for multiple reasons, exactly like what you said. Where if the ball's still in, you can use it to kind of grab and grow from the skin up to pull the ball off, or even if you're going to take some out on the trail, you can use it to slowly pick a lot of those little uh, needles up and out easily uh, right there on the trail. Or, as he said, either tweezers or needle nose. But, you know, this depends on how much much hospitalization type time you want to take on the trail versus do it at the hotel later that evening or at camp. (laughs) Oh, yeah, riding for several more hours with a ball or a ton of thorns in your arm, you know, it doesn't feel too good, especially when your jersey's rubbing up and down on them. Yeah. it's you crazy. Know, it doesn't more feel like do... they're that deep, but man, the second they get in there, you start moving like that. And they're in the forearm a lot, those sons of bitches. But the second you start holding on to the grip, you could just feel them digging into your muscle. It is not fun. <laughs> no, it's not. And when they come back up a week or two later, when they surface back up out of your arm or shoulder, that's always fun. Oh, uh, so with Bill Grant again, one of the gentlemen that was helping me out, he goes, "Now just get ready because in about three months you're going to be sitting there at dinner or whatever, and you're going to look over and you're going to be like, what is that? And then you're going to pull it out and it's going to be a cactus needle.' And I was like, "No shit!" And he's like, "Nude, seriously, it's going to happen." And I'm out. With, I, mean, I think I literally think my wife and I were out to dinner, and I look down and there it is, and I pull it out and I show it to her and I go, "Do you see that?" She's like, "Yes." I was like, "That's a cactus needle." from that damn video X amount of months ago. Like, no way. So I called Bill Grant the next day, and I was like, dude, that was the weirdest thing. Because it was not there the day before. But then that night, it just decided to work its way back out of my skin. That's the craziest thing. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. All of a sudden, you got this bump on you, and you pick it like a pimple, and bam, there it is. Yeah, weirdest so. thing. All right, so you did an awesome job at the, at the rally this year. Um, is Is what's... I think you've got more rally in you in the sense that bigger, bolder, you know, more extensive rally around the world. So I have to imagine that you're thinking like that as well. So what's on your radar with, uh, with you? Well, that's pretty fun. Ra- that's funny rally. you mentioned that. Um, I'm actually going to head to the coast to coast rally at the end of November. Uh, that's on mainland Mexico. Yeah, that's gonna um, be fun. And then next year, I'm going to do the Sonora. Uh, in next April, I'm going to do the Sonora Rally. Okay. For practice, and then I'll probably end, I'll end up doing the Baja or um, the Baja Rally, the Nora Rally, which is like the week after that. I plan on doing the Baja Rally again next year, and then for 2017, uh, my goal is uh, for so I have a whole year to prepare and get things ready, but I want to go to Dakar. Oh, that's awesome. Man, that would be so freaking cool. 
So you got to try it once in your life, you know. So I, I, I that, agree. That, that'll be my year. I agree, and I think you're on the right path. I mean, it seems like you've kind of got the, the the correct amount of escalation to work your way there, so you can kind of work out the kinks, if you will. Now, how how does someone like yourself? Now, you're you're very you're very well known in the desert racing community, but not so much in the rally community. Even though you do have the Baja Rally win, but how do you? get to Dakar do you do you apply do you have to go to a to go to a race and qualify how does it work for someone like yourself um the, what I what I, my research I mean obviously we have private uh people that you know that fund that will help me fund it okay um I have some I'm you know trying to work on that right now um I do have one big sponsor monkey business uh cleaning products which will help me uh you know it's helping me put things together um, but you know, you submit to the, the ISO um, for that car, and with my resume, um, I've been told it shouldn't be a problem. Oh, that's awesome! So in your case, it's just a, a a submission. That's that's interesting. I didn't realize that the car was just was kind of a submission factor. But obviously, you do have to go probably through you know the ISO, the board, and they kind of have to okay. Yeah, I because, got I got to submit yeah. an application. They have to go over it. But with my with what my resume reads, um, I've been told by you know. A, a lot of people that it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, I have 11 Baja 1000 wins under my belt. I have eight uh, Baja 500 overalls under my belt, you know, so it, it's not like I'm just some rookie that has never raced before. Um, so, you know, and I think it'd be good for, you know, America to have another American down there racing. So I, I think, I think it should go pretty good. That's bitching dude. Well, Good luck with all that stuff. It's going to be epic. I look forward to it. Um, I really do hope that I get a chance to hang out with you guys again at Baja Rally 2016. It would be awesome to be down there again. Um, I'm going to make sure my dad doesn't take the RV this time, though it was <laughs> though it was a bitching experience. Um, you know, it was too much, and my dad's hard-headed, just like myself, and didn't listen, and so we learned the hard way. But that son of a bitch was driving that thing faster on some of those roads than most people in their sprinters were. So, you know, whatever. He's crazy. Uh, yeah. He <laughs> Papa Pierce has been known to have some issues mentally. And I think I got half of those as well, so we'll just call it an even, but still. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you very much for calling in the show. Congratulations on your 2015 Baja Rally win. And uh, good luck with the car and and, and obviously the... the you know, the kind of the steps it takes to work up towards that because it's going to be epic to watch and we really hope you make it happen. Yeah, me too. I really appreciate you having me on tonight and uh, looking forward to uh, working with you again soon. Absolutely. Yeah, that way I can say, hey, uh, Mr. Hengfeld, can you teach me how to win the amateur class in the Baja Rally? And you can be like, Brian, I'm sorry, you don't, yeah. have, that, you don't have that in you. And I'll be like, damn it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, don't blow up your 450. Got it. Yeah, exactly. Come prepared. Winning. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, we really appreciate it, and you have fun out there. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, Bye-bye. man. Oh, yeah, it was. It's one of those deals where everybody's like, "That's Steve Hingfeld. Like, that's him." Like when I was there in 2014, and again, like I, I've I, I've followed and I know stuff about Baja, but not being a desert guy, you know, growing up in Louisiana, doing enduros, all that kinds of stuff. And then kind of coming to Texas, going west a little bit, I started to meet people um, that have gone and made teams and done the Baja 1000 and all that kinds of stuff. You're like, oh, cool, you know, what's this? Like, again, it's you're just starting to, like, kind of peek into that world. But it, now that I've gone down there and now that I've raced it a little bit, um, the Baja 1000, Baja 500, 250, all that kinds of stuff, it's just, oh, my God, it's got to be crazy. Like, it's just insane that those guys do that for so long. The Baja Rally is a much safer way to do it. Um, again, I've said it many times. It is a timekeeping enduro on steroids. So if you're somebody out there that enjoys timekeeping enduros and wish they hadn't gone away um, or moved to a easier format, then go sign up for the Baja Rally or go sign up for Coast to Coast. Go sign up for Sonora. These are some amazing events. They're a lot of fun. Yes, there's a little bit more money involved, but I promise you the three to four days that you're going to have out there chasing a compass heading and reading a road book is just so much fun and a lot of cool com- camaraderie that goes on with it. So I'm definitely a good two thumbs up for some rally time. So you guys need to check that kind of stuff out. Well, so what's going to be coming up? So this weekend, uh, National Heron Hound and the West Hair Scramble Series has a doubleheader in Lucerne Valley. So the 24th and 25th. So go check that out. 
last National Hare and Hound of the Year. So round eight, I believe, for those guys. And then after that, we've got the 31st and 1st GNCC Ironman, last GNCC of the year. And then, of course, we'll be moving over to Boise, Idaho, November 7th for uh, Enduro Cross. We got to see Cody win- Cody Webb win again this past weekend. It's awesome. There is a Nexon girl on the podium, Stephen. Two thumbs up. Like, two thumbs up. She's she's a looker. She, it was funny because uh, uh, Tyler McCall, I think was his name, Tyler Tyler Kincaid. Uh, I was on Facebook, some of my friends with. Uh, I'm on the podium at the Enduro Cross. Da, 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 and I'm like, awesome job, dude. Like, you know, hell yeah. And then I was like, you know, it was like, awesome job, exclamation point. I wish I could stand next to, so you know, so-and-so, whatever, whatever. And uh, it gets two likes. That, you know, that little comment gets two likes throughout the day, right? And the first one, I knew the name. And the second one, when, I, when my phone alerted me to it, I was like, who's that name? So I go and look, and then I click on the name. It's her. And it was the chick. It's the chick. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and I was thinking, I was like, maybe I should send her a friend request. And I was like, no, nah, that's probably no, a little creepy. No, no, too creepy. Yeah. <laughs> it's too creepy. But no, yeah, so I was like, oh, huh. That's the internet for you. That's the internet for you. I was like, so we had fun. It was interesting. Again, so seat time. We would like your review. Okay? So we've had people win koozies because they gave reviews. We people had win tickets to the Moto 7, which we're going to be doing another giveaway next week. So pay attention for that. We are going to be having a Get Lost premiere here in the next couple weeks in the in the McKinney area. Uh, maybe Dallas. We're trying to find a theater for that. It's kind of crazy. Um, not much money, but a theater. Right. So, but if you give us a review on iTunes or on your podcasting program, make sure you alert to us and and let us know because we check that stuff and we will make sure that if you're one of the people that has one of the good ones or one that we find entertaining, I wouldn't say that it's one of the good ones because I'm not saying give us a five star review. Be honest. Have fun with it. Just, you know, that's it. Have fun with it. That's what it's there for. But do that kind of stuff. And if you're one of the people that we enjoy your review, then you will get some koozies out of the deal. Um, of course, YouTube comments are the same way. If you have fun with a YouTube comment, we're going to have fun with that, giving you some koozies. So do that kind of stuff. Go to Selfy, S-E-L-L-F-Y dot com and search for 15 Minutes Raw Greatness, TKO Enduro, whatever you want to search for. That's your way to get 15 minutes of premix, just glorification greatness. Um, it's epic. It's $2. Please go purchase that thing, download it, have a bunch of fun watching it because you'll watch it more than once. And support Seed Time a little bit. We would really appreciate it. So again, thank you very much to Fly Racing, to Kenda Tire, and to Stillwell Performance for their support of Seed Time. This has been episode 158. I am your host, Brian Pierce. You can find me on the internet at, at Woody B. Pierce all over the place. And of course, SeatTime.co is the website. That's where we archive everything. I just burped. Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Seed Time. We're on Twitter. It's at Seed Time underscore CO. We're on the Instagrams. It's at seat time it's pretty easy i hope you guys had fun we will be back next week it's going to be a great time jordan will be much better looking than me on the couch it's going to be fun so thank you we'll see you then peace